Welcome to the wide world of esports, the show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, my guest is Tom Leonard. Our topic is play games, create jobs, change lives, making a difference one podcast at a time. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Catherine, for having me on. All right, so I understand you have a podcast too. Tell us about your podcast. Yes, everyone should have at least one podcast. Um, I, I've, I've got a podcast that I started a few months ago called Gamers Change Lives. And what it is, it's a show about how to create an esports business really from anywhere in the world. And one of the things that I found was I want to tell stories from the, I want to tell the stories of people who are creating esports opportunities all around the world, not some person in California telling you how to do it, but hearing how it's done in Ghana, how it's done in India, how it's done in the Philippines and Vietnam and so on from people there. And the focus of the, of the podcast is how esports can create jobs. Uh, jobs are, you know, especially youth unemployment is a big deal in the world today. And esports is not always considered some um, an avenue to create jobs. So, you know, I know that we were going to have a guest from Ghana today, and unfortunately, he just couldn't join on time. And now, you know, you're looking at Africa and Asia and Europe, and you know, what is your what what is the breadth of your your podcast in terms of who you're talking with? What we want to do is we want to tell stories from people in emerging markets. So we're talking to people in in Asia, in Southeast Asia, India, a lot of people in Africa and also in South America as well. So all around the world, not so many people from the United States or from Europe or from Central Asia, but just more of people from emerging markets. And why emerging markets? Because that's where the biggest opportunity is to create jobs, the biggest need for creating jobs. I mean, years ago, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. So, you know, I, 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 it's kind of gets in your blood. It's like, okay, how can we create jobs? And the way this really started out was there was a, a buddy in, uh, in Ghana, Kwesi uh, Hayford, and he's, the, he, he's a legend in esports in Ghana. And one of the things he was telling me one day, he was creating these opportunities because I was showing on social media. It's like, Kwesi, what you up to here? And he said, I'm trying to create these jobs for these women so that they, can, they don't have to be on the streets. And I was thinking, wow, that's that. I mean, he's just that kind of a guy. But it's just like there's an opportunity because esports is already creating jobs all around the world. And people don't always put the two and two together that it can create jobs really for, for people at all different levels. And so what kind of jobs are we talking about here? That's, that's the great thing, because so many times people think of jobs in esports as being the player. I want to be a pro player. I want to be a YouTuber. I want to be a Twitch player and so on. But what happens is, and it, we know that, but not everyone does, that that's just a little tip of the spear. I always tell people it's like uh, it's like the entertainment business here in, in, in LA. It's like people think of the entertainment business as being an actor, but it's not. It's like all the jobs that the industry creates. So when it comes to esports, there's all the jobs, if it's a team, there's all the jobs created, you know, in, in supporting the team, the marketing, uh, human resources, things like that, tournaments. It's like, think of all the marketing for doing a tournament. All, I was talking to uh, Eniola Idan, who created this great, um, they created this, this group called Gamer in Lagos, Nigeria. And they put together a Gamer X 10 Nation tour. And she was telling me all of the jobs that she was, she was just mentioning. And the one that stood out was the drone operator. They even hired a drone operator. I was like, wow. That's really great. It's like someone had a, had a really good job, but it, it, there's so many, there's such a wide breadth of jobs, and that's one of the things we want to talk about in the podcast. So people aren't just thinking, you know, just the player. It's like, no, no, no. There's so many other opportunities. Sure. So how do you find guests? I mean, you're talking about places all over the world, and I would think it would be difficult to connect to them. One of the things that has been a really pleasant surprise is people have resonated with the idea of the podcast. So even though we've been new, our producer, Reginald Asawa, there from Ghana, he's just been so good at 
finding good guests around the world. And, and a couple of things that, that I learned from him was just ask. I mean, it's like, if you're looking for guests for your podcast, just get out there and ask people if they would like to be a guest, because if you don't ask, you don't get. And also to, um, to be able to have a, a good message to be able to tell. And with Gamers Change Lives podcast, it, it's a pretty good, easy concept for people to get behind. And also there's not, you know, I haven't found very many other people out there that are, are doing the same thing. So, or really anyone. So we're fairly unique that way. Sure. And, you know, I can totally relate to the just ask because there was a few guests that I've had that, that I was kind of surprised that I did ask. I remember um, I, I was on a panel speaking at an esports conference and um, it, I think it was a um, casino esports conference. And it was in a, um, because it was during COVID times, it was in a, like a virtual reality or a 3D kind of environment. <laughs> and so Fatality, um, he, he's on my panel and he starts telling us about how there's a place you can go fishing in the, that virtual reality environment. And so I said, how do you find that? He goes, oh, I'll show you. So his avatar led my avatar to the fishing hole. And so he was showing me how to fish and we were fishing and I go, would you like to be a guest on my show? And he said, sure. And that's how he ended up as a guest on my show. No, that's great. No, just take the initiative and uh, don't be afraid to, to ask people. That's great. And so um, what, what's been the response um, from your audience? We have had, like I was saying, you've been really pleasantly surprised on the response. I have been doing a little bit of Facebook marketing. And in the last two months, I've had literally, it's been stunning because I've had over 2 million impressions on Facebook. I mean, we're talking Warner Brothers level of, of uh, reach there. So, uh, you know, particularly people in Africa, in, uh, in uh, emerging markets that have been interested in learning more about the podcast. So, you know, over time, obviously, you know, we're going to be getting better and getting better at getting the word out. One of the things I've learned on the marketing side, make sure you do videos. That's why you're really smart, Catherine. You're doing videos every week because that's, that's something that people uh, can uh, just pay more attention to a video than a little text somewhere or even an image. So video is king. Now, are your podcast, is it, is it just, to listen to, or do you have video? No, we, we're, we're starting out for season one. Uh, we're, it's, it's audio only for a couple of reasons. It's just like, just to make it easy to start out. It's like, let's learn the, learn, it sim learn the simple thing. But at the same time, the service, the platform that we use does produce video that we're able to use for marketing purposes. So we can get little clips and put them out on, uh, on social media to get some attention. Sure. You know, I remember when I had um, Sharuk Tanvir, he goes by Jack, he's in India. And I had him as an early guest and I had him on a second time. I, he was a favorite guest of mine. And he had to get up at like in the middle of the night to do it. Um, it was at around uh, 3 a.m. his time or something like that. Do you have challenges with time zones when you're dealing with um, Africa and India and other countries. One of the things that I've been, another pleasant surprise is that people are really um, um, willing to do things at, at some odd hours themselves. So we're able to, to work that out. As long as it's not too early in the morning, I can usually uh, cope with that here. But yeah, I mean, we're talking to someone in Africa or we're talking to someone in India, we're talking to someone in Vietnam. It's just it, it, the, the time and uh, really does um, come into play, but you do what you got to do. So, um, what are you learning about esports in other countries? Like, where is that in relation to the United States? Because, I mean, if you look at South Korea, they're ahead of us, and but you know, and they're you know, I I don't think we can say that United States is like superior in esports. I mean, I think we're doing well, but you know, how does it all compare? I, I have been 
amazed at how well the e how developed the esports world is in some of the most unlikely places. I mean, we're looking at doing, I mean, one of the things starting out was doing uh, Mortal Kombat tournaments in sub-Saharan Africa. And these people, they were, they were able to put on a, a, a tremendous program, a tremendous tournament that would have been this, just as, as well done there as it would be done here in Burbank. So that, that's been really uh, Im impressive. The things that I find that are challenges, especially in Africa, are um, connectivity problems, and in particular, ping rates. Because if you're in Zambia and you're trying to play Mortal Kombat and you're playing against someone in the UK, their ping rate is really, really low and yours is really, really high. So to, to compete on a, on a level playing field is really, really difficult. And it, it, talk to anyone in esports in Africa and they'll talk about servers. Because the servers are, some servers are in South Africa, but not nearly enough. So we, we, uh, we have an episode coming up soon on someone from, um, it's going to be able to talk about servers in South Africa, because that, that is a huge issue on the professional level. Now, if you're just playing casually, that's different, but, um, you know, at the professional level, it's, you know, we're talking to Queen Arrow, who's from Kenya, and she's a fighting, uh, fighting game professional. And for her, it's like, it's completely different. You know, she traveled to South Africa. It was so much easier for her to play in South Africa than in Kenya because the ping rate there, the local ping rate was a lot better. But what you see is that these people will, people all over the world, they're, they're, they're just really resourceful on what it is, what it takes to make it happen. And I, maybe that's the, the most interesting thing. And those, those are the kinds of stories that I like hearing the most. Sure, and you know, I can kind of relate to that because Hawaii has the ping rate that's the challenge. And, oh yeah. You know, Overwatch actually came here because the problem was between Japan and uh, the US mainland, there was a ping rate issue. So they felt like, okay, if we bring our teams to Hawaii and we uh, put in, you know, use a cable between Tokyo and um, Honolulu, that we can reduce that ping rate and, and have a fair tournament. So they did um, an Overwatch series at University of Hawaii, and that worked pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Things you just wouldn't, just don't come to mind if, if, if you're in a place like here in California. Right, because you kind of have a nice situation there. You know, I, I would think that that you don't have that problem. But you know, if people in the US mainland pay, play other countries, you're always gonna have that problem. Yes, yes. It's something that's always gonna be there no matter what. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think it's kind of an equity situation. But you know, when I think about Hawaii, if, if Hawaii people play each other, they don't have that problem. And I'm sure that they can have local tournaments and not have those problems. But in Africa, like, so what are the, in, what have you learned are the most um, kind of saturated esports places? Is it Ghana, South Africa, is Nigeria in the mix or, you know? Nigeria is huge. Kenya is huge. And of course, North Africa is, is also huge. You know, Egypt, Anubis, the team there, and Tunisia has, has quite a few people. Ghana is, yeah, uh, uh, has, has quite an um, esports industry there south africa is 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 big as well so um yeah kind of where you'd expect right and how do you know um have you learned anything about how they're adopting adapting to this you know kind of the where we we were shut down because of covid and then you know kind of emerging out of it do you have you learned anything about how that's influenced um esports around the world Yes, I mean it. It made a huge impact while it was a the the biggest problem, and it kept people from doing a lot of different things. A lot of the people in Africa, for example, were not able to travel outside of Africa to go to events. Let's say in Singapore, uh, I know for one uh, one instance. So travel outside of the region was really really tough at the time. the The word that I'm getting now is things are pretty much back to normal, back to what it was before they're just kind of like everywhere else in the world. Sure. 
And so what's the most surprising thing that you've learned in this adventure? Probably the biggest surprise is the, the receptiveness of the, the idea that esports can create jobs and that these jobs aren't just players playing, but there's, there's a whole, you know, the drone, drone operators, there's, there's a whole list of other jobs out there. So I, I guess one of the surprising things to me, I've never really had to explain people more than esports can create jobs. Every, everyone that I talk to, they're nodding their head. It's like, you know, I don't have to try to convince anyone of that. The other thing that I've um, been surprised at or noticed as a consistent message between most of the guests, especially the people who have created their own successful esports organizations, is that they saw a need and they created their own job. So talking to Sagrenair in India, he's like, but there was no one talking about esports, so they created the Times of Esports. Well, they created the Times of Esports. Well, no one was, there was no platform to, for players to play. So they created Clan. So what I noticed is the recurring theme is that um, people see a need and they go after it. They don't sit there and wait for someone else. You know, Gee, I wish someone else would do this. It's like, no, how can we do this? Is, is kind of the mantra. Hmm. Terrific. Okay, so let's look at your motto. Uh, play games, create jobs, change lives. How do you think lives are being changed? Anytime that you create even one job, you are going to change someone's life. I mean, it's just like, you know, it'd be nice for us to think that, oh, we're going to be able to create all kinds of jobs. But, you know, maybe we'll be able to do that and, as we progress. But just to get people to think of, you know, if first to go from the play games, create jobs. It's like, okay, we're, we're establishing that you can do that. <clears throat> and it's just going to be well known that if you are creating these jobs, because we're not talking about necessarily, you know, some big cushy job in an office sort of thing. A lot of these jobs are, are part-time. When I was talking again about Gamer X in Nigeria, um, and Yolo, she was talking about, they created over 250 jobs over that, over the course of that uh, week. And it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. If you have 250 jobs, what if there's a, a tournament every week or every month, these jobs start to add up and it makes a huge difference to a lot of people who may not, you know, think of the, um, think of the training that you need to be in esports. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't go and get a degree in esports. You've had some really good guests talking about esports at the University of Hawaii that have been really interesting. But in most parts of the world, there's not necessarily training for esports um, specifically. So people aren't coming to it, you know, with uh, with this big background in esports management sort of thing. So uh, people are coming to it from all different levels, and those and so there's there's room for all kinds of people to be able to have a job in esports. You know, Danny Martin, um, he has that company Exposure and. They do a lot of training um, that allow people to get jobs in esports. Is there any equivalent to your knowledge in other countries? Have you heard of that at all? Very little that I've come across. And that was one of the reasons that I was really happy to talk to John Cash here recently, who created an esports program at uh, Johnson C. Smith University in North Carolina. And what was interesting talking to him was in kind of getting his blueprint, how do you create these kinds of programs in an existing university? How do you get people to buy in? How do you get the school to buy into it? How do you get it funded? Things like that to maybe give some people in some other places some ideas on how they might be able to do that. Because the other thing that we find is um, governments, government organizations are a lot more invested, a lot more uh, you know, part of the esports world than they are in the United States. I mean, here, you never would think of the government as being the supporter of esports. It's like, no, that's just not, you know, that, that's just not, not the culture, the industry. Here, uh, talking to uh, Mitch Esquera from Galaxy Racer, he was talking about one of the Galaxy Racer works with a lot of governmental organizations. They are huge in that. And, one, and I was asking him about what's in it for him, what, you know, what's in it for Galaxy Racer, what's in it for the government? And it was really interesting because he was saying, you know, esports needs the recognition, you know, the 
the uh, recognition that governments can give to them as a real business. And governments need access to their population that's you know, younger and they don't always know how to get a hold of them. So he felt that the, one of the reasons that they worked so, with so many government organizations was that it was beneficial to both sides. Sure, and I would think in other countries, especially developing countries, that the government has plays a little bit bigger role in the citizens' lives, and and in that that it would be a more likely match to use esports, um, you know, in a like a government program as opposed to like the United States. Yes, yes, yeah, completely different. So that's something different that you just wouldn't think of automatically coming from here. Sure, sure. So um, what, okay, so if you were to get a guest from a country that you haven't had yet, and what country would you really, are you dying to have a guest from? Brazil. Really? Brazil. It's like, oh, you know, you've talked to Ulysses. And uh, he was on your pot. He was on your show, and he's going to be on our show here coming up soon. Hopefully, we're we're putting that together. So he's going to be from Chile, um, you know. From but yeah, talking to people in in Mexico or Central America or South America is kind of a gap. In I mean, we don't have yeah, you know, we haven't had a lot of shows, but we want to talk to people more um, there as well because we talk to people in India, Southeast Asia, and you know, we were talking with you know with people at Ninjas in Pajamas. Ninjas in Pajamas does a lot of work. Their, their teams are based out of Brazil, a couple of them. And it's like, it'd be really interesting to see, well, how, you know, why Brazil and how are they going, you know, how does that work into their, their uh, scheme of things? So. When you're talking about an international podcast, you do have one barrier that's probably a big barrier and that is language. How do you deal with a situation where someone doesn't speak English. Are you using an interpreter? Well, uh, no, a good question there, because what we're doing is we're, we're ignoring that problem in season one, and we are only in, um, in English. And, but one of, the, one of the things that's really big, is, especially in, in Africa, is uh, West Africa is French speaking. So it's like, that, that's a big thing. But talking to Mitch uh, at Galaxy Racer, I asked him about how do they deal with um, with languages, because Philippines, a thousand languages, Southeast Asia, everyone's speaking. He said, he said, people, he, he gave the example of K-pop. He said, people are, you know, are fans of K-pop music and they can't understand a word. He said, it's not because they speak Korean. And so he said, uh, subtitles. Subtitles are the most important thing in Galaxy Racer. He said, because he felt that the language of gaming was, you know, people would watch other people just to learn what they're doing. He said, but subtitles are, are the way to get the message across. We're not there yet. Sure. Well, you know, you start in English and maybe you can, you know, branch out a bit. But yeah, that is a challenge. And it, it, it even can be a challenge if you have an English speaker that has a heavy accent and you have a little bit difficulty understanding them. Um, so what's the most recurring theme that you've heard from guests? Um, yeah, yeah. When I was mentioning about people, people taking initiative, it's like that's that's to me that's the fun part is to hear, hear someone talk about how they were doing. I got something just just today from uh, uh, from someone in Ghana about what they want to do. It's like people taking initiative. It's not someone giving them permission or someone telling them what to do. It's they're just like. Hey, we're going to go. We're going to go make this work because because you know we think it can. And in the in the meantime, we're going to be playing games and having fun doing it. So yeah, just the initiative that people from all different parts of the world has been really amazing. You know, and that's a really good lesson for anyone watching because I think we're there's uh, this fear of uh, of doing something new. You know, we kind of. And I, I think it is based on fear. Uh, but if you're in a culture where you know you can't have that thing unless you figure it out and do it yourself, um, that, you know, you just do it, you know, without, you know, and you create things from, the, from, from nothing, you know. And I think Americans sometimes are a little bit 
more used to just, oh, someone else will do it. And, you know, or I can't do that because I didn't go to school for that. But, you know, you're talking about populations that no one went to school for that. And, and, and they may not have had any um, college experience. And, you know, is that right? Yes, yes, that, that's, that, yeah, that's exactly true. And that's one of the interesting things, just talking to people around the world, is to get their perspective on it and how it's different from our perspective here. Sure. So what is the future of Gamers Change Lives? Don't know yet. Don't know yet. We kind of did season one to see, you know, to see if we could do this and to see uh, the response for it. I just think one of the things I want to do, I, uh, certainly talking to people who are in the international development space, um, I've got a lot of contacts at Stanford Seed, for example, from the old Stanford days. I just think there's a lot of opportunity to get esports further well known in the inter international development world, because that's where there's a lot of money and a lot of resources. And if you're in international development, you're always looking for new projects, especially projects that can help create jobs for young people. And it's a, you know, a, a proven industry that can do that. So that's one of the areas that we want to go into. The other thing I want to talk about soon in more detail is the money. Follow the money. It's like, how do, how do you get sponsorships? What do you do with that money? And how do you make it work? Sure. And are you looking for sponsors for your show? Nope, we are not. We're, we're lucky we don't have to worry about that here yet. Maybe down the road. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, you know, uh, I, I think it's exciting. And I, you know, as a video podcast host, it's exciting to see you, you know, you were a guest, uh, kind of an early guest, actually, on this show that's been going on for two years. And yes. And now, and then you've kind of moved from, uh, you've pivoted in, in, in your work here, and it's exciting to see this. I know, I appreciate uh, your, your support. Just whenever I communicate with you online, it, it's always, you're, you're very supportive of what we're doing. All right, so I'll give you the last word to let people uh, know how they can reach you and how they can become a guest on your show. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, we're always looking for guests, that's true. You can find us at our website is Gamers Change Lives Podcast. There it is. Gamers Change Lives Podcast um, out there. You can subscribe to us on you know, every place that there's a podcast, you know, Apple, Spotify, you name it. We are out there. It's Gamers Change Lives. Listen to it and send us your, your, your feedback. We're always looking for what people are thinking about what it is that we're doing. Fantastic, Tom. Well, thank you so much for being my guest today. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, and thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Um, and we are always looking for guests for the wide world of esports. So let me know. You can email me at um, Catherine at norlaw.com. And uh, the wide world of esports is moving to an every other week schedule. So I hope you uh, look for us in two weeks. My guest will be Shane Vanderkui of Green Mouse Academy. See you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.